Hi, I'm Alan Joyce. I'm the Director of Content Development for Wolfram Alpha. Uh, I oversee the teams that are responsible for most of the cultural and historical data in Wolfram Alpha uh, and in the Wolfram language, among other things. Uh, so these are sort of the general domains I'll be providing a quick overview of today. Um, I'm starting out with, um, there's some useful online resources. Uh, we've got a page here that we created for version 12, which I'll be sampling some uh, examples from. Um, covering a lot of the data in these, these general domains. So historical data, notable people, media, uh, languages, religion. Um, there are also uh, pages for uh, sort of broader topics in the Wolfram language. And these cover uh, both entities uh, and sort of data specific functions and also other sorts of things that are useful in combination with uh, entity-based data. Um, you know, cultural data, people in history, uh, some information on linguistic data. So obviously there are, there are data sets here related to writing scripts, alphabets, languages, but also lots of other uh, you know, functionality in the language that can be used to operate on those entities or operate on texts themselves and do all kinds of interesting linguistic analysis. Um, one of the things that was uh, new in version 12 uh, that I like to make sure people are aware of is we have had entity-based data. We've had the entity framework uh, in the Wolfram language for a few versions. Version 12 is the first time that we've really documented each of those entity types. Uh, so there's a reference here uh, that links out to uh, individual pages for each of the entity types that are exposed in the Wolfram language. And the, things that's really, the thing that's really useful here is, you know, whether you're familiar with the entity framework or not, uh, you know, this will give you some examples of the syntax you can use to retrieve data, to look up entities, uh, but also just for cases where you might not be familiar with exactly the, the scope of a particular entity type out of the several hundred that we've got. Uh, this is a nice overview with some sample entities, some sample entity classes, you know, a list of all the properties that are available for that domain, uh, some more general information about you know, sub properties and additional annotations you can access, and then just some, some useful examples uh, in that domain that you can just immediately get in and start computing modify those to do similar kinds of analyses that you're interested in, work with other kinds of entities, and so on. Uh, so I just I, I found this to be a really useful reference myself in, in working with the language. So the focus that I wanted to start with today, um, I, for people who aren't necessarily familiar with the entity framework, just very briefly, you know, this is a way within the Wolfram language to get direct access to a lot of the data that's available through Wolfram Alpha, but in a more sort of atomic, uh, you know, directly computable form. Uh, the easiest kind of way of interacting here is, you know, type in control equals in a notebook, type in the name of an entity like Albert Einstein, uh, and that gets resolved to uh, an entity. And this is the, the canonical representation of uh, an entity of type person who is Albert Einstein. Um, you know, sometimes there are there are alternate interpretations here. And, you know, for example, you might, it's kind of interesting to discover that there's apparently an Albert Einstein public school and also an artwork titled Al Albert Einstein. You could get data on. Um, but just sticking with the person, you accept that interpretation, and then you can, you can operate on that entity and get more data about it. Um, you can also discover or you know, pull up sets of entities by just getting random entities of a given type. Uh, you can also just retrieve a complete list of all the entities of a given type. Uh, so here, this is just a, you know, a subset. There are 32, almost 33,000 uh, physical artworks that we have data on in the Wolfram language. So you can pull up all or any or subsets of those. Uh, retrieving data is pretty straightforward. Again, once you've got an entity, uh, you can just retrieve single properties like the, uh, the runtime of uh, endgame. Uh, you can retrieve multiple properties, just providing a list of those names, uh, get the release date and the runtime. Uh, and you can also get that data back in some different forms. Like, for example, it might be more convenient. You might want to get a structure back where you have uh, an association of property names to values. You can also get uh, entity associations, entity property associations. Uh, you can get all the data in that form. If you don't specify a, a specific property or set of properties, just retrieving everything. Or you can get things in a nice uh, data set format, which can be useful for just browsing through data uh, and obviously using all the other data set syntax in the language to cut into and slice and dice and rearrange this data however you want. Uh, similarly, with multiple entities, you can do the same thing. You can get 
associations or data sets uh, with all of the data or subsets of the data for multiple entities. Uh, and again, you know, the one of the great things about entities is that these work directly uh, and just sort of automatically with lots of other functions in the language. Uh, so just picking some types that we're going to talk about briefly here today. Um, historical countries, for example, you can uh, take the Roman Empire uh, and just automatically get a, a polygon showing sort of the maximum extent of the, the Roman Empire and feed that into geographics. Uh, you can uh, get a timeline plot, which uh, I do enjoy this function. Uh, you can retrieve, let's say, all of the music albums by the Beatles. Uh, whose release date is before 1980. So we're just kind of trimming out lots of re-releases and special editions and things. Um, and then plot on a timeline, plot the, the, the canonical release date of each of those albums. And so it's a nice view of you know, any kind of data where the entities have some kind of uh, default date associated with them, a creation date, a release date, um, and getting a view of that. Also, we've been making a lot more effort uh, over the last few years, particularly to align entities to external data sources. Uh, and so, for example, you can just feed an entity directly into Wikipedia data, and that's going to call the Wikipedia API. And so you can just you can actually pull up the, the text of a Wikipedia article or parts of the text of a Wikipedia article for a given entity. Uh, and then you know, feed that into things to do linguistic analysis. You can incorporate that text into other sorts of uh, reports or visualizations you're generating, um, and so on. So uh, we're going to go sort of broadly through four main sets of, of data here. And this is just going back to, uh, to this page, which I think, again, is a useful reference. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, sort of historical entities, uh, looking at connections between historical entities, data on countries, military conflicts, uh, some data on some of the entity types related to arts and media in the language, so books, artworks, uh, movies. Uh, some data about notable people, uh, looking at um, genealogical connections between people, uh, using Wikipedia as a, a way to sort of uh, analyze the relative popularity of people over time, uh, and also looking at some of the given name data in the language. Um, and finally, just more broadly, language and culture, uh, looking at data on uh, mythological figures in various uh, traditions, and also uh, a little bit of an overview about some of the fine distinctions between some of the entity types related to languages, alphabets, uh, and writing scripts. Uh, so just jumping into history, uh, one of the good things here, you know, history related entities in the language um, are really useful because they align with other types of entities. So you might have historical sites that are associated with particular people or with historical events. Uh, and you can you can generate uh, implicit entity classes, you know, constructing an entity class of a particular type uh, where you set some sort of constraints on that class. You know, I want to find all the historical sites uh, that commemorate uh, FDR, and then I can feed that result into a, a geo list plot. And, uh, you know, I can see a, a set of entities here. I, I can get other data about those or just feed them directly to a map. Uh, again, let's say historical events. Uh, where that somehow involved Anne Frank. And again, going to timeline plot, we can get um, a little bit of data about each of those events and look at those on a timeline. Uh, moving up to things that are a little more complicated, uh, we've put a lot of work into curating and adding data about historical countries. Uh, so not just sort of broadly when they existed, but even uh, adding polygons associated with particular years or year ranges uh, for their existence. So we could say, again, uh, Roman Empire is a good familiar case. Um, given that historical country, what's the, the, the rough start date, end date, uh, and a polygon, which, uh, you know, the default polygon um, is uh, just showing, uh, I, I believe, the, the maximum extent of that country. It's not a particular year. Um, but we can choose a particular year, though. You know, let's say we apply dated to the polygon. Uh, we can look at the extent of the empire in the year zero. Uh, we can use other functions like geo area and uh, apply those to find the area for a specific year uh, or for all years uh, for which polygons are available. Um, we can also then take uh, 
say, construct a, an implicit entity class here. We're looking at uh, all the historical countries uh, for which we have a polygon in a given year. Here, the year is 330. Uh, and let's take the largest 10 uh, and we'll plot those. Um, so we get a list here. And then we can feed that list um, into geographics and get that set of countries laid out on, on a map for that year. Military conflicts, another uh, really complicated, fairly deep uh, domain that we've put a lot of work into manually curating data here. Uh, we're combining things from you know, some crowdsourced uh, references, you know, other public sources, a lot of internal research dealing with people who are, are more expert in these things. But uh, this enables us to do things like, you know, given a, a sort of larger military conflict, you can dig down and look at data on individual battles associated with that conflict. Um, for a specific conflict, uh, one thing that's good to note here, and again, this is documented, but um, the data that gets returned for things like who were the main actors or what were the military casualties, uh, data gets returned in lists that correspond to the list of main actors. So if you ask for casualties uh, for this battle, what you're getting is uh, 15,000 for the Roman Republic, 2,500 for Carthage, uh, and that sort of correspondence between the main actors and the way data is laid out goes through all of these entities. Uh, I won't try to explain all this, but I think the notebooks will be accessible afterwards. You can you can look at these, and these examples are all coming from that uh, first version 12 uh, release page I showed before. Uh, but we can do some interesting things, like uh, you know, write a function that retrieves and plots casualties. Uh, accumulated by each of the participants um, across all the battles in a given conflict. So looking over time, uh, you know, the growing accumulated casualties for each side uh, in the Second Punic War. Uh, we could do the same kind of thing, but looking at uh, relative size of forces over time committed to these battles. Uh, and then we can also match that back up with uh, historical country data. And we can uh, look at the changes in uh, the amount of land gained and lost by each side over the course of the conflict, which in this case is a pretty interesting uh, exchange of, of territories. Uh, moving on to arts and media, uh, you know, like I said, we have, we have data on a lot of different uh, kinds of domains, books, periodicals, music, movies. Um, and looking at books, uh, we've got more than 10,000 and sort of always growing uh, book entities uh, for which we've got data on authors, publication dates. Also, in many cases where the texts are in the public domain, uh, the full plain text of the book, uh, which is useful to be able to retrieve. You can do some additional text analysis that way. Uh, just keeping things a little more simple, you know, we can do things here like let's find all the book entities that we know about uh, that were first published in a given uh, time span. Uh, we can get that list of entities. And then we could do something like generate a word cloud where the author's names are weighted by the number of books in this set. Uh, and it turns out we are very heavy on Jules Verne. Um, Charles Dickens runs a close second for this time period. Uh, looking at visual artworks, uh, there's a lot of data here. Uh, you know, a surprising amount that we've, we've pulled from a lot of different public sources, museums, from uh, Wikipedia, other crowdsource sources. Um, but these are related to both the, the creation of the work and also, in many cases, a lot of data about the, the physical attributes of the artwork. Um, so let's take for a, for a given work, you know, artist, type of media, um, art forms that are also canonical entities you can use to uh, you know, look up artworks that are of type painting or in the genre narrative art. Uh, but then also things like height, widths, uh, thumbnail images wherever possible. Uh, you could also use entity classes here to find works grouped by artist, uh, by year, or you know, like I said, virtually any one of these properties. Uh, you know, here we're saying let's get all the artworks by Jackson Pollock uh, and get a list of those. Uh, or here, let's say, take all the artworks uh, that we know about that were completed in 1972 uh, and just taking all the ones for which we have an image. Um, you can also combine those. You know, one of the things that makes implicit entity classes really powerful is that um, you can just you can combine lots of different uh, constraints to get exactly the set you want. 
So here, let's say we'll take um, all the artworks we've got by Jeff Koons, uh, and let's find the, the, the 30 tallest, uh, given that he is known for producing some fairly monumental works. Uh, you can also plot their physical locations, you know, in cases where something is uh, a permanent installation, or we know the, the museum, the location that that artwork is held at. Uh, we can see where some of those are located on a map. Uh, you can also do something like generate an image collage of some of those entities uh, where the image sizes are automatically weighted uh, by the relative height. So kind of looking at a bunch of different works, which ones are the largest and down to those that are the smallest. Um, movies, also a really interesting case. Uh, and this is another one where we're you know, constantly expanding this. Um, upcoming releases are covered here, lots of historical data for uh, movies released in the US and around the world. Um, and so that's data that goes down to cast members, box office grosses, you know, uh, often poster images, uh, lots of other data about people involved in the creation and, and uh, the uh, costs of producing or marketing films. Something interesting to do here is, you know, given a particular year of release, let's say 1980, uh, we can find the top 10 movies uh, ranked by US uh, box office gross, uh, get a list of those. And then for those, we could retrieve the posters. And again, I kind of like, you can tell I like image collages, uh, generate a collage where the posters are weighted by each film's total US box office gross. Unsurprisingly, Empire Strikes Back uh, pops the heap there, but there are some others I just didn't really think about associating with that year. Uh, what do we have? Blues Brothers, Stir Crazy, Nine to Five. Uh, for people in general, uh, there's lots of data available for people. Uh, you know, and and then again, these are often links out to things like music works or artworks. Uh, you know, people who have been on manned space missions links to those kinds of entities. Uh, birthplaces, death places, birth and death dates, occupations, you know, lots of, of key information about people. Um, one thing that is relatively new, we, we've had this for a few years now, um, that we have data on family relations for people. And in most cases, uh, and again, this is constantly improving, the, the values of these are also entities themselves. Uh, you can imagine that kind of keeping up with building out that graph is a is a very long tail kind of project. Um, in many cases, you know, we may only have sort of the most notable family relations, uh, but we try to we try to keep uh, building these out. When they are represented by Wolfram language entities, it's possible to do some really interesting things with graphs um, and sort of follow some of those family relationships out. So here I'm using nest graph. Uh, I'm taking children of King George the sixth. Uh, and going uh, three levels out, following the children of each of those people. And uh, you, know, you can start constructing a nice plot of uh, the royal family here. Uh, another thing that's interesting to do with people, like I mentioned before, uh, the fact that we have alignment between lots of person entities uh, and also entities in other domains too, to be clear. Um, you can directly access both the text of Wikipedia articles, but also uh, access uh, some of Wikipedia's own data about daily page hits uh, for a given uh, a given page. So, you know, for John Lennon, for example, we can get the daily page hits um, from Wikipedia. The time range is a little bit limited uh, through Wikipedia. You know, we can go back to uh, 2015. We can get up to a little bit earlier this year. Um, well, actually, I can probably, I may have evaluated this some time ago. I think that, that the, the latest data might be a little bit more recent now. Um, yeah, you can get up to yesterday. Uh, we can generate a plot of um, those page hits over time. You can see some cycles here. Something that you, you often see is that some of those spikes that pop up each year are associated with notable events in that person's life. You know, sometimes their uh, birth or death dates or other notable events. Um, and those are kind of interesting ways to figure out uh, some of those connections. Uh, for a given person, you can also do things like uh, look up some of the notable bands they've been in. So here we're taking um, music act, ent act entities and finding music acts who's, who have Paul McCartney as a member. So we've got the Beatles and Wings, um, 
without passing any judgments, we can uh, we can get the daily page hits for each of those bands. Um, we can plot them. We can see that there's quite a quite a large discrepancy between the popularity in Wikipedia for the Beatles versus Wings. Or you could even dig down a little deeper and like, let's say, take all the, the members of the Beatles and we can look at uh, the relative wiki popularity over time uh, for each of them. Um, don't forget about Pete and Stu. Uh, moving on, still sort of in the people domain, but not uh, you know, related to specific people. There's a lot of data that we've got, um, mostly from the Social Security Administration in the US. Uh, who releases, uh, you, you may see the top boy and girl baby names. They, they tend to put out a press release every year. They also release a really, really detailed uh, data set for, with data on new name registrations all the way down to, I don't know, I think names that have occurred at least five times or 10 times in their data set, in their database each year. So it's thousands of names. Um, you know, we have data on, 116,711 different given names. Um, and so there's data you can access here, like uh, what's the, the fraction of all births and other registrations uh, for a given name in a given year. Um, and you can see sometimes these show a fairly steady trend over time. You know, John has been getting, accounting for less and less and less of a fraction of, of all given names. Liam has had an upswing uh, in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, but also note that even though the fraction might decline steeply, you know, John is still hovering in the top, you know, hasn't fallen below the top 30 or so. Uh, it's just because there's an, an increased diversity in the pool of given names uh, that there are. It can be interesting here to start matching these up with other domains. Uh, for example, let's take the, uh, the release date of Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, let's look at the popularity of the name Tiffany. Uh, this is always kind of an interesting one. That's almost right at that point when that movie came out, following years, um, a big spike. Um, or people who are Game of Thrones fans, it will probably be unsurprising to discover that many of the names, even names that aren't actually names but are titles, um, start showing up in, uh, in this data set over time. Um, and yes, Arya wins here too. Um, using an implicit entity class, you can also, you know, sort of the, the basic use case here is what are the top 10 male and female game, female names in a given year. So for the latest year for which data is available, Liam is up on top, Emma on top for the girls. Uh, and you can, you can do this for other arbitrary years and look at these changes over time. Turning to language and culture more broadly, um, this is uh, the mythology um, uh, entity type is an interesting one. Uh, this is the result of, uh, like some of the others I mentioned here, a fair amount of manual work on our part uh, and combining data from a lot of different sources. Um, for a given mythological figure in some particular tradition, you can get a, get a property association, get a sense of all the kinds of data that's available. Uh, you know, alternate names, there are often a lot of these. Um, you know, places of birth, which sometimes are real places of birth, sometimes are fictional ones. Um, temples, patronages, things they are, they are sort of known as being the patrons of, things that are, are symbols of them generally, um, types. And so you can use some of those things to start digging into different cultures. Like for example, let's say, uh, let's find all the mythological figures uh, from Greek mythology who are of type deity. Uh, you can get a list here. Uh, or you could go to uh, filtered entity class, uh, which is an interesting new function in 12, uh, where you can write an arbitrary function uh, that you can use to do some more powerful lookups than you can with the, the default syntax here. So here I'm looking for um, uh, other mythological figures from any tradition, not just Greek, um, whose uh, symbols property contains any of the same symbols as Zeus. Uh, so these are other other deities who have thunderbolt, eagle, bull, oak, royal scepter as part of their symbols. Um, and then we could say, let's you know, let's group these by culture. We've got some Mesopotamian, Roman, Greek, Indian, Egyptian, Etruscan. Uh, so kind of looking using this to look at some connections across different cultures can be useful. Uh, 
looking at patronages, kind of this is just aggregating these and seeing, uh, you know, which which types of gods and other figures do we have the most of? Probably unsurprisingly, fertility, childbirth, and uh, figures associated with the underworld are very strongly represented in all these cultures. Um, and then again, you could say, uh, let's do a filter density class, uh, and we can then construct a graph sort of showing all the connections between mythological figures associated with the underworld and, and all of their different patronages and where they overlap and the kinds of things that uh, there are other connections on here. Um, finally, uh, just going even more broadly, just into information about languages. Uh, people who have used the Wolf language for a long time know that we have you know, word data, you can get data on words, and, and there's all sorts of other dictionary and text analysis related functions. Um, there are also, we've added uh, several new entity types over time. I think the enti language entities have been there for a while. Um, we have also worked on adding separate entity types for alphabets and writing scripts, uh, and also then some other types that are just used to sort of normalize some of the values of those things. Um, but you can do things here like, uh, let's say, take Spanish. Uh, there's some data on the lexical similarity of other languages. Uh, so let's uh, find um, some of the other languages uh, we can build a, that are related to uh, Spanish, similar to Spanish. Uh, we can build a graph where the edge weights uh, correspond to the lexical similarity between those languages. Um, and then start doing this to just, uh, we, could, we could build this out a few more layers and start following out a more complex graph uh, showing relationships between different languages. Uh, like I mentioned, we've added separate entities for alphabets and writing systems, writing scripts. Uh, so writing scripts and alphabets, in some cases, um, people tend to get these confused. Like, for example, there is, there is a Latin alphabet, there is a Latin writing script. Uh, the properties that are covered by each of these are very different. The writing script uh, is mostly about... Um, characteristics of the script. Uh, there are some ISO codes. Uh, there are other things that say, you know, this is a script that's written left to right, or others are right to left or bi-directional. You know, there are um, other pieces of information about um, the baselines, about whether there's white space that gets used. Alphabet entities are really just about the, the sequence of characters that are used in that particular alphabet. Um, but then again, here also, you know, there are links out from alphabets to, uh, you know, what are the languages that use and what are the writing scripts that use those. Uh, you can, again, here use an implicit entity class. Uh, let's find writing scripts that share certain characteristics with the Latin script. So looking at other things that are, uh, uh, have a bottom writing script baseline uh, that are written left to right, that have white space between words. Um, and we get this list of, uh, of other writing scripts. Uh, we could also find other alphabets that make use of the Latin script. Um, so this is a much larger list. This is just taking a random sample, but you know, lots of other languages that make use of, um, uh, or sorry, uh, other alphabets that make use of the Latin script. Uh, and then from there, we could say, let's take all these other uh, alphabets that make use of Latin script. And we could generate a word cloud uh, where the characters are weighted by the number of alphabets they appear in. So sort of uh, unadorned characters tend to show up the most frequently, but we can see lots of other things with other diacritics and other marks on them here. So that's kind of taking us all the way back. Um, you know, again, a lot of these examples, at least in some form, are represented on this page. Uh, this is a good jumping off point for uh, data about history, about arts and media, people, uh, languages, and other cultural things. Uh, some lists here of some of the specific types that are covered. Uh, links out to some of these other guide pages that are really useful for exploring not only uh, specific entity types and uh, data directly available in the language that's relevant to that domain, but also lots of other uh, you know, useful functions that, you, that may apply to work you'd be doing in those areas. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I think if you have any any questions, I'd be happy to take them. But um, I've just seen some some comments here. But uh, I think that's about it. Uh,
there'll be another uh, Twitch talk coming up soon. Hope you keep tuning into the series. Thanks.